Chapter 14 Regulation of Spiritual Gifts in the Local Assembly 14.1-26 Prophesy is the superior gift. Paul contrasts tongues and prophesy. 14.27-40 Order in the Church in regard to spiritual gifts. Paul said that the Corinthians should covet earnestly the best gifts. 1231. In this chapter Paul tells them what the best gift is. It is prophesy. Then he explains why the Corinthians should not emphasize tongues over prophesy. The Corinthians had a distracting preoccupation with tongues. The church was confused and carnal partly because the women were taking precedence over the men and neither the men nor the women were submitting themselves to the word of God. Women in the ministry is discussed at end of this lesson. Prophesy is supernaturally speaking for God by the direct leading of the Holy Spirit. Tongues were supernaturally speaking in a different language, praise and gratitude by the Spirit unto God. Tongues were assigned to the Jews next door, 122, so that they would believe that God was now working with Paul and his converts. As mentioned previously in chapter 12 and 13, Paul, lead by the Lord, said that the gifts would end when Christ had given him the full revelation of the mystery, 13.8. 13. Christ in his earthly ministry, said that signs will follow them that believe and that they will speak with new tongues, Mark 16 verse 17. There cannot be very good communication between people who do not speak the same language. At the Tower of Babel God said, Let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech, Genesis 11 verse 7. This is how God caused people to spread out over the earth. When the Holy Ghost came down on the 120 in the upper room, they spoke in tongues, Acts 2 verses 4 to 6, essentially reversing what God did in Genesis 11. When Christ began his heavenly ministry through Paul in Acts 9, tongues and the other sign gifts continued during the transition period, as recorded in the book of Acts, until the end of Acts 28. Today, believers who rightly divide should not be deceived into believing that those gifts still apply today. They should build their lives on the Word of God. My soul was so thrilled to learn from a dear sister on Facebook and I quote, My nephew has read the book, God's Secret, three times. He said that was when the light bulb went on. He said all the guys want to read it and has made up a list with their names on it. My nephew told them he wasn't giving that book up until he has gotten all out of it, he can. He has finally seen the light. I am so happy for him. He was a hard nut to crack, like most of my family. Thank you, Marianne. The book did the trick. I was thrilled beyond describing. I thanked God all the way home. A peace I felt knowing he was saved. 14.1 Paul said to follow him as he follows Christ, 11.1, but now he says to follow after charity. Charity is the kind of love we can only display when Christ is working through us. Christ wanted the same for his followers in his earthly ministry, John 13 verse 34. Prophecy is the message, while to prophesy is to give the message. In 12.31, Paul said, covet earnestly the best gifts and now he says that prophesy is the best gift. 14.2-4 God understood the foreign languages that were supernaturally spoken, but not the other people unless they spoke that same language. In his spirit that person was speaking mysteries to God. Someone who is speaking God's words, build up the body of Christ with words of encouragement and comfort from God. Edification is to build up by instruction. Exhortation is to give encouragement, advice, and counsel. Comfort is to relieve, console, and support. Tongues are for the speaker's own good, if he understands what he is saying. It was the lesser gift of the five mentioned in 1228. But, to prophesy is for the good of the church. 14.5 Paul wants everyone to be able to speak in tongues, but he would rather have them prophesy. Prophesy is greater than tongues, because unless the speaker, or someone with the gift of interpretation, interprets what he is saying no one will understand what was said. 
14 colon 6 Paul is saying, What profit will you have if I speak in foreign tongues that you do not understand, unless I speak something that you can understand by revelation, knowledge, prophesying or doctrine, teaching? 14 colon 7 dash 9 Unless there is a distinct sound of a musical instrument, no one can make sense of it. Unless a trumpet gives a clear sound, no one will charge into the battle. If no one can understand what you are saying, you might as well speak into the air. 14 10 11 There are many different voices or real languages in the world, and all are important. But if I, Paul, do not know that language I will be like a barbarian, an uncivilized foreigner, to the other person, and he to me. 14 12 14 The Corinthians overemphasized tongues. It is best to do things that edify the church. The person who speaks in a tongue that no one understands should pray that God will help him interpret it. Paul used himself as an example. He said that if he prays in a tongue to God, his spirit is praying, but his understanding is unfruitful. 14 15 19 What is it then to be fruitful? It is being able to pray with both the spirit and understanding. I will sing, says Paul, with both the spirit and understanding. Or else when you bless God in the spirit, how shall a person who is learning be able to agree with your thankfulness to God when he doesn't understand what you are saying? Truly you are saying thank you to God well, but the other doesn't understand what for. Paul is grateful that he spoke more languages than all of them. He needed them in his travels and ministry. Paul said that he would rather speak five words that can teach others than 10,000 words that no one understands. An example of five words is Christ died for our sins. 1420 The Corinthians are complete in him, Colossians 2 verse 10, but they need to grow spiritually. Malice is the intent to bring harm to someone. Paul wants them to be children in malice, but he doesn't want them to be children or babes in their understanding. 14.21-24 Even if God speaks to the people in a language, they can understand they will still refuse to listen to his voice. Deuteronomy 28 verses 45 and 46 Tongues were assigned to the unbelievers of Israel. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 While prophesy is for believers. In the tribulation, tongues will be assigned to the unbelieving in Israel again. Mark 16 verse 17 if the whole church is gathered and unbelievers and those who are learning Paul's sound doctrine enter and hear the chaos of everyone speaking in various languages, will they not say these people are crazy? But if everyone is prophesying, the unbeliever and unlearned will be convicted and instructed by God's words. 14.25 The secret things in their hearts are exposed by hearing God's word, Romans 10 verse 17, and they will agree that God's spirit is speaking to them by those who prophesy. He will recognize his need to decide to believe the gospel or to grow spiritually. At the great white throne judgment of sinners God will judge unbelievers by what Paul calls my gospel. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans 2 verse 16, 14 26 Paul said that everyone was given different gifts, 12 10, 28 to 30, so why are the Corinthians saying they all have the same gifts? Everyone had a song, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, and an interpretation at Corinth that was a competition for the limelight. 14 27 33 Paul now begins to delineate the rules for speaking in tongues. Tongues and the sign gifts must be used with orderly restraint and only if an interpreter is present. There should be groups of two or three and one of them should be the interpreter. If there was no interpreter, the tongue speaker should keep quiet. He could speak later at home to himself and God. Let the prophet speak in groups of two or three, with one judging or discerning the spirits, 12.10. If anything is revealed to someone who is sitting nearby, let him not blurt out what came to him, but let him wait to speak. Let the first speaker pause and allow him insert what was revealed to him. Everyone should take turns prophesying so everyone can hear, learn, and be comforted. You should control your spirits, and they should be subject to you. You are not to be ruled by them or be impulsive. 
God is a God of order and peace, not confusion. 1434, 35, the context is speaking in tongues and prophesying. Women were not to take part in praying in tongues and prophesying in the church, 11, 5. When Eve sinned, all women were made subject to their husbands by God, Genesis 3, verse 16. Today, there are no sign gifts, so women may speak in church and ask questions at an appropriate time. Paul also put the responsibility on the husband. If the wife had any questions, she should ask her husband at home. It seems that because of the culture the men talked among themselves and the women were sitting in another place. If the women had a question, they could ask their husbands at home what was said. Perhaps the women were abusing the gift of tongues and using them out of place. They may have been getting carried away with them and being too emotional. Both men and women, if acting out of place in the church, tear it down instead of building it up. Both can be deceived. 14.36-39 The word of God did not come to the Corinthians alone, but it came to Paul first. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that Paul is writing the things that the Lord commanded him to write. Because Paul is their apostle appointed by Christ. 1 Timothy 6 verses 3 to 5. If anyone does not want to agree with the fact that the Lord is speaking through Paul, then let them remain ignorant, destitute of knowledge and uninformed of what Christ is doing in his heavenly ministry through him. Have an earnest desire to prophesy but do allow the speaking of tongues. 1440 Paul wants the church to be orderly. Today, since knowledge of the Bible does not depend on spiritual gifts, anyone can teach it. God uses imperfect people to do so. 14 colon 1 follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Paul said to follow him as he follows Christ, 11 colon 1, but now he says to follow after charity. Charity is the kind of love we can only display when Christ is working through us. Christ wanted the same for his followers in his earthly ministry, John 13 verse 34. Prophecy is the message, while to prophesy is to give the message. In 1231, Paul said, covet earnestly the best gifts, and now he says that prophesy is the best gift. Two for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. God understood the foreign languages that were supernaturally spoken, but not the other people unless they spoke that same language. In his spirit that person was speaking mysteries to God. 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. Someone who is speaking God's words, build up the body of Christ with words of encouragement and comfort from God. Edification is to build up by instruction. Exhortation is to give encouragement, advice, and counsel. Comfort is to relieve, console, and support. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Tongues are for the speaker's own good, if he understands what he is saying. It was the lesser gift of the five mentioned in 1228. But to prophesy is for the good of the church. 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Paul wants everyone to be able to speak in tongues, but he would rather have them prophesy. Prophesy is greater than tongues. Because unless the speaker, or someone with the gift of interpretation, interprets what he is saying, no one will understand him. 6. Now, Brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? Paul is saying, What profit will you have if I speak in foreign tongues that you do not understand, unless I speak something that you can understand by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or doctrine, teaching? 7. And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe, flute, or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? 
Unless there is a distinct sound of a musical instrument, no one can make sense of it. 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Unless a trumpet gives a clear sound, no one will charge into the battle. 9. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. If no one can understand what you are saying, you might as well speak into the air. 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. There are many different voices or real languages in the world, and all are important. 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. But if I, Paul, do not know that language, I will be like a barbarian, an uncivilized foreigner, to the other person, and he to me. 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. The Corinthians overemphasized tongues. It is best to do things that edify the church. 13. Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. The person who speaks in a tongue that no one understands should pray that God will help him interpret it. 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Paul used himself as an example. He said that if he prays in a tongue to God, his spirit is praying, but his understanding is unfruitful. 15. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. What is it then to be fruitful? It is being able to pray with both the spirit and understanding. I will sing, says Paul, with both the spirit and understanding. 16 Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? Or else when you bless God in the spirit, how shall a person who is learning be able to agree with your thankfulness to God, when he doesn't understand what you are saying? 17 For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Truly you are saying thank you to God well, but the other doesn't understand what for. 18 I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Paul is grateful that he spoke more languages than all of them. He needed them in his travels and ministry. 19 Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Paul said that he would rather speak five words that can teach others than 10,000 words that no one understands. An example of five words is Christ died for our sins. 20 Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. The Corinthians are complete in him, Colossians 2 verse 10, but they need to grow spiritually. Malice is the intent to bring harm to someone. Paul wants them to be children in that, but he doesn't want them to be children or babes in their understanding. 21 In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Even if God speaks to the people in a language, they can understand they will still refuse to listen to his voice, Deuteronomy 28 verses 45 and 46. Dot. 22 Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Tongues were a sign to the unbelievers of Israel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, Acts 10 verses 44 to 46, while prophesy is for believers. In the tribulation, tongues will be a sign to the unbelieving in Israel again, Mark 16 verse 17. 23 If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? If the whole church is gathered and unbelievers, and those who are learning Paul's sound doctrine enter and hear the chaos of everyone speaking in various languages, will they not say these people are crazy? 
24. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. But if everyone is prophesying, the unbeliever and unlearned will be convicted and instructed by God's words. 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. The secret things in their hearts are exposed by hearing God's word, Romans 10 verse 17, and they will agree that God's spirit is speaking to them by those who prophesy. At the great white throne judgment of sinners God will judge unbelievers by what Paul calls my gospel. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, Romans 2 verse 16. 26 How is it then, brethren? When ye come together, every one of you hath a psalms, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Paul said that everyone was given different gifts, 1210, 28-30, so why are the Corinthians saying they all have the same gifts? Everyone had a song, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, and an interpretation, at Corinth it was a competition for the limelight. 27 If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Paul now begins to delineate the rules for speaking in tongues. Tongues and the sign gifts must be used with orderly, restraint and only if an interpreter is present. There should be groups of two or three and one of them should be the interpreter. 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. If there was no interpreter, the tongue speaker should keep quiet. He could speak later at home to himself and God. 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Let the prophet speak in groups of two or three, with one judging or discerning the spirits. 12.10. 30. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. If anything is revealed to someone who is sitting nearby, let him not blurt out what came to him, but let him wait to speak. Let the first speaker pause and allow him to insert what was revealed to him. 31 For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Everyone should take turns prophesying so everyone can hear, learn, and be comforted. 32 And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You should control your spirits, and they should be subject to you. You are not to be ruled by them or be impulsive. 33 For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God is a God of order and peace, not confusion. 34 Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. The context is speaking in tongues and prophesying. Women were not to take part in praying in tongues and prophesying in the church, 11 colon 5. When Eve sinned, all women were made subject to their husbands by God, Genesis 3 verse 16. Today there are no sign gifts so women may speak in church and ask questions at an appropriate time. 35 And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Paul also put the responsibility on the husband. If the wife had any questions, she should ask her husband at home. It seems that because of the culture the men talked among themselves, and the women were sitting in another place. If the women had a question, they could ask their husbands at home what was said. Perhaps the women were abusing the gift of tongues and using them out of place. They may have been getting carried away with them and being too emotional. Both men and women, if acting out of place in the church, tear it down instead of building it up. Both can be deceived. 36 What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? The word of God did not come to the Corinthians alone, but it came to Paul first. 37 If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 
If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that Paul is writing the things that the Lord commanded him to write. Because Paul is their apostle appointed by Christ. 1 Timothy 6 verses 3 to 5. Dot. 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If anyone does not want to agree with the fact that the Lord is speaking through Paul, then let them remain ignorant, destitute of knowledge and uninformed of what Christ is doing in his heavenly ministry through him. 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Have an earnest desire to prophesy, but do allow the speaking of tongues. 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Paul wants the church to be orderly. Today, since knowledge of the Bible does not depend on spiritual gifts anyone can teach it, God uses imperfect people to do so. Women in the ministry. All supernatural sign gifts have stopped. So, knowledge of the Bible depends on study and enlightenment by the Holy Spirit. Those in the congregation should all be respectful of the pastor and the other members and study to be quiet, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11. However, if the pastor asks a question anyone can respectfully answer it. Everything is to be done for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ and not for vain glory. Everyone should ask themselves what their motive for speaking in church is. Let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another, envying one another. Galatians 5 verse 26 If we have learned something by the teaching of the Spirit of God, we have to determine if this is the time and place to share that information. We should at some point and in some place share what we have received. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 There are no perfect pastors, teachers, or humans. We all make mistakes. I have never met a man or woman teacher that doesn't make a mistake. Our final authority is not a man or a woman, but the Holy Bible. We can trust God, but he uses imperfect people to teach his word. Women are to respect their husband regardless of if their husband is saved or not. Ephesians 5 verse 33. But what if a woman does not have a husband that is saved and knowledgeable in the word of God to ask at home? Notice that the in Ephesians 5 verses 25 to 27 is the church that Christ washes with the water of the word so that he can present it perfectly to the Father. In other words, Christ will directly teach a believer his word regardless of gender. There are several places in the Bible where women labored with Paul for God. He said in Philippians 4 verse 3, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. To the Romans he said, Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord, Romans 16 verse 12. These women were working with Paul getting the gospel. Out, not baking cookies. The my gospel is all of what Paul taught in Romans 2. While women are not to be pastors, they can teach the Bible. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12. In this pastoral epistle Paul says he does not want a woman to teach men in the local assembly, nor exercise authority over a man, and to be silent when learning in the church. Then Paul explains the reason. It was because Satan found it easier to trick Eve than Adam, 1 Timothy 2 verses 13 to 15. Eve was deceived by Satan and sinned. Had Adam been at her side and protected her, she may not have yielded to Satan's lies. Adam sinned knowingly, choosing to be with his wife rather than to walk with God. Adam was probably hoping God could solve their problem. Knowing the curses God proclaimed on them in Genesis, Paul says that a woman of faith will be kept from deception through childbearing. She will be too busy caring for her husband and children to fall into idleness which Satan takes advantage of, 1 Timothy 5 verse 13. But men can be deceived, too. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 20, Paul says two men had blasphemed, spoken against, God, Hymenaeus, and Alexander. One is most likely the man mentioned in 2 Timothy 2 verses 16 to 18, Hymenaeus and Philetus. 
Their error was that they said that the rapture had already happened, and this error was overthrowing the faith of some. These men had apparently forged a letter and made it seem as if it came from Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. What is my point? Go to 2 Corinthians 11 verses 3 and 4 Notice how Paul is concerned about the whole assembly. Both men and women at Corinth were beguiled. Correctly handling the word of God requires the spirit of God enlightening our minds. Most of us women know that we can be deceived and are on our guard against it. But how many denominational and non-denominational pastors do you know of who first of all are not King James Bible believers and secondly, do not know when the body of Christ began? Many erroneously say the body of Christ began in Acts 2 because they do not divide the word of God where God divides it between mystery and prophecy. This is why we must always give verses to back up everything that we say. We can learn from the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit, but we can also learn from each other. I recommend that people listen to many grace teachers and multitude of counselors there is safety, Proverbs 24 verse 6. I continue to learn from many grace Bible teachers in church, in conferences, on Facebook, and on YouTube. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we learn that some members in the church at Corinth were even saying that the resurrection of saints would never happen. My point is that the mark of an effective Bible teacher is that they are a King James Bible teacher, knowledgeable in the Word of God, and rightly divide. It is not if they are male or female because both can be deceived. Our final authority is the King James Bible, not a man or a woman. Satan's lies are powerless against the perfect word of God. In English, it is found in the King James Bible. Richard Jordan of Shorewood Bible Church in Chicago also agrees that women are supposed to teach the Bible. At the conference last July, he said, and I quote, somebody asked, why do you have ladies teaching? The answer, Titus 2 says, let the older women teach. What are they supposed to teach? The Bible. Who are they supposed to teach? Anybody who will listen. Some may say, well, I don't think you should do that. Okay, then you don't do it. Listen, you are free to do whatever you want to do, and so am I. In our ladies' ministry, none of the women want to be in leadership as pastors. They all have an understanding of the leadership in the local church. In case you have not noticed this, conference is not a local church. This is a gathering of the saints and so forth. I don't want to get into this topic now. We have our ladies seminar on CDs and all kinds of other CDs available in the lobby. Paraphrased quote from Richard Jordan, July 25th, 2018. In summary, no one is supernaturally given knowledge today. We all have to study the Bible and be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. For one saint to share what they have learned with another is not usurping authority, but blessing another. There are no distinctions in the body of Christ. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3 verse 28. I believe that it is biblical for a woman who is strong in knowledge of the word of God rightly divided to teach someone who is weaker in the faith. Aquila and Priscilla taught Apollos, Acts 18 verse 26, and Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him, 2 Timothy 1 colon 5, 3 15. Mature believers learn from Bible teachers who teach what God says. Chapter 15 concerning the hope of resurrection. 15 colon 1 34 proof of the resurrection. 15 colon 35 49 process of the resurrection. 15 colon 50 58 pending victory over death as the motivation for faithful service. This chapter is one of the most important in the Bible for the body of Christ. The rapture is exclusively found in Apostle Paul's writings. It is one of the mysteries given to him by the ascended glorified Lord Jesus. The mystery of the formation of the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace is flanked by Christ's two appearings, first, to Paul on the road to Damascus, and second, at the rapture, Titus 2 verses 11 and 13. The rapture is our blessed hope. 
someone who believes that the body of Christ began in Acts 2 can become confused about our rapture and mistakenly believe it will occur at Christ's second coming. Some of the Corinthians were saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. Paul now answers their questions regarding the resurrection and gives facts to prove it. Christ's resurrection is crucial for our salvation. We have a living Savior who conquered death for us, so our confidence is in the work He did for us, not in any work we do for Him. Paul will demonstrate why our rapture is linked to Christ's resurrection. Some people may wonder what is the baptism for the dead, 29. Others may want to know what are the beasts at Ephesus, 32. Some may ask what is meant by, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners, 33. These questions are answered in this lesson. 15 colon 1 Paul had declared the gospel to them and they had received it. They were already justified and standing by faith in Christ. Christ has done all that is necessary for our salvation. It is a free gift that can only be received by faith. We stand when we have his righteousness imputed to us, Romans 4 verse 25, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. The gospel is not something we do, it is something Christ has already done. 15 colon 2 If they were saved what does Paul mean? As we know, every time the word saved is used in the Bible it does not mean from hell. This refers to being saved from deception and false doctrine if they continue in the truth of the gospel that Paul taught them. Look ahead to verses 12 to 14, some were saying that they would not be resurrected, that the dead would not rise. Paul says they will be saved from this evil communication see verse 33. Paul will show that both Christ's death for our sins and his resurrection are essential components of the gospel of our salvation. Without the resurrection, we believe in vain and without profit, because Christ's resurrection is tied to our own. 15 colon 3 Paul repeats what he told them in Corinth when they were saved. He had shared what Christ had revealed to him. Christ died by crucifixion for not only Israel's sins, as prophesied, but for all mankind's sins, not prophesied. 15 colon 4 buried confirms his death and the placing of his body in the tomb. He rose again because the Father accepted his perfect blood sacrifice as full payment for all sins that have, are, and will be committed. According to the scriptures, means just as prophesied in the word of God. Christianity rests on facts. His death, burial, and resurrection are facts, and they were confirmed by many eyewitnesses. The grave could not hold him, the empty tomb is proof that he rose. See what Luke, Paul's companion beginning in Acts 16, wrote in Luke 24 verses 45 to 48. 15 colon 5 Christ appeared to Peter who denied him three times, and then to the twelve, Matthias being one of them, James was not dead yet. Twelve is a collective term. Paul is separate from the twelve, he is the one apostle to the one body of Christ. 15 colon 6 Paul is the only one who reveals that Christ was seen by more than 500 at one time. Most of those eyewitnesses of his resurrection were still alive. 15 colon 7 Christ was seen by James, then by all the apostles including Thomas. 15 colon 8 Paul saw Christ apart from the 12 in Acts 9. Paul is a separate apostle for a separate ministry. He was born out of due time, Galatians 1 verses 1 and 11, 12. All believers have Christ in them, John 17 verse 26, Colossians 1 verse 27. 15 colon 9 Paul says that he is the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because he persecuted that church, the believing remnant of Israel or little flock, Acts 8 verses 1 to 3, Galatians 1 verse 13, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. This remnant will receive the kingdom and sit on the 12 thrones, Luke 12 verse 32, Matthew 19 28, 21 43. 1510 Because of God's grace Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. He says, Christ did not give me this grace for nothing, because I worked more fervently than all of them, but it was not me, but the grace of God that was with me. 
Paul is always careful to acknowledge the power of Christ in him. 1511 Most of the believers at Corinth were saved by the gospel, good news, that Paul preached, but some were also saved by Apollos, and others by Peter and his group. Both Peter and Paul preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But Peter did it as a murder indictment, bad news, Acts 2.23, 4.10, 5.30, 1.12. Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah to sit on David's throne in the kingdom, Acts 2 verses 29 to 38. 15 12 Paul asks, if the 12 and the 500 eyewitness and I all say that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you denying what we preach? As we know, Paul and the 12 were willing to die for the truth of the resurrection. 1513 Paul will now demonstrate the importance of the resurrection by a series of ifs. Everyone's resurrection is dependent on the fact that Christ was the first to be resurrected in a glorified body. Paul revealed that Christ's sacrifice paid for all sins. Christ's resurrection and ours are linked together. 1514 If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is useless and your faith is worthless. 1515 Paul says, We are found false witnesses because we said that God raised Christ from the dead. If he did not, then there is no resurrection of the dead. 1516 Paul argues, If there is no resurrection of dead believers, then that means Christ did not rise. 15 17-19 They would be still in their sins if the Father had not accepted Christ's payment. If Christ did not rise, their faith has no eternal value. Then those who have died believing in Christ, whose bodies are now asleep, will not live again. If we only have hope of this life, then we are all doing this for nothing, wasting our time, and should be miserable. 1520 But the truth is that Christ rose from the dead. Remember Paul saw him several times. Jesus is the first of those who died in faith to have a glorified body. 1521 The reason Christ had to die was because death came by Adam. Christ became a man and was resurrected to undo what Adam had done so that others could have eternal life. 1522 We have to be in Christ to be saved. This is the proof text of the resurrection. 1523 The order of the resurrection was that Christ is the first fruits. From the dead, Colossians 1 verses 18 and 19. Jesus was first fruits of those that will have a glorified body. They that are Christ's at his coming. The kingdom saints at his second coming. 15 colon 24-26 After his millennial reign and the final rebellion, Christ will have secured all the believers to live in heaven and on earth. Then those who compose both realms, his kingdom, will be delivered to the Father. Christ will put down all opposition. All the enemies, including death, will be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 verses 9 to 15. 1527 in Psalms 110 verse 1, the Father speaks to the Son, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Christ is excluded from what is placed under his feet. He is God. 1528 When all is done, the Son will be subject to the Father who put all things under him. That God may be all in all. 1529 30 What good is it for all who have been baptized, identified with, into Christ's death? Romans 6 verses 3 to 9 If they will not rise? Why are we risking our lives if we will not be resurrected? 1531 Paul says, I affirm so that you can have this joy yourselves. I remind myself every day that I am dead to the flesh daily. I am dead to sin and self, Romans 6 verse 2, and alive unto God. To overcome our evil flesh, we need to know, reckon, and yield to the fact that God says we are dead to sin, crucified with Christ, but alive unto God through Him, Galatians 2.
2 verse 20. We are spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. We know, mind slash spirit, reckon, believe in our heart, soul, yield, our bodies a sacrifice, and take right actions. It is a relief that our lives are not about us, but about Him. This old earth and heaven and everything in it will all burn up. God will make a new heaven and earth. Our value is life with Him in the new heaven and new earth. 1532 If I had to fight with those beast-like men at Ephesus, Titus 1 verse 12, What profit is my struggle if the dead do not rise? The mob uproar in Acts 19 verse 40 had not happened yet, but Paul was already dealing with those adversaries. Let's just eat, drink, and be merry if there is nothing more to life than the present. But this life is not all there is. 1533 34 The corrupt communication that the resurrection would not happen was having an effect on their conduct. Paul says awake from this deceptive false teaching. Is there not a wise man among you? Speak no evil saying there is no resurrection. This evil communication and thinking is sin. Paul wants to throw cold water on them so they will wake up and think and act like the righteous saints they are. They need to follow what Christ teaches them through Paul. He blames the Corinthians for the lack of understanding of what God is doing and his word. 15 38 Some were asking about the specifics of resurrection, so Paul begins to answer that. They should know that something can't come alive if it hasn't first died. We are going to get different bodies than what we have now, but God may use the bare grain such as an atom of the one we have now. Christ also spoke on this subject, John 12 verse 24. God will do what pleases him, and each seed has its own body. The glorified body retains the identity and individuality of the believer. 1539, 40 Just like there are different kinds of flesh, men, beasts, fish, birds, so there are different types of glorified bodies. The heaven-bound saints and the earth-bound saints will both have glorified bodies, but they will each be different. One kind is celestial, suited for heaven, and another is terrestrial, suited for the earth. 1541 Celestial bodies differ in glory. Each star shines with a different intensity, Daniel 12 verse 3. In astronomy, the lower the number is, the greater its magnitude. So, a zero is the brightest, and a five is the dimmest star we can see with the naked eye. 15.42-44 This is how the resurrection of the dead is also. Each person will shine with different wattage. Christ in us will be our light. Our corrupt bodies are raised without corruption. Our bodies are sown in dishonor and weakness but raised with power. It is sown in natural body but raised a spiritual body. 15.45 Adam became a living soul, Genesis 2 verse 7. But Christ became a quickening spirit who gives life and light to those who trust in what he has done. The last Adam reversed the curse the first Adam brought into the world. We will have his light in us as we shine in the heavens. 1546, for seven just like the spiritual, Christ, was not first, but the natural, Adam, so is it for us, we are natural, then spiritual. Adam was of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 1548, 49 we were earthy and made in Adam's likeness. But God will change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Philippians 3 verse 21. 1550 we cannot inherit the kingdom of God in our flesh and blood bodies. Remember that we have been made joint heirs with Christ and will be glorified with him. Romans 8 verse 17. It is not because of any merit of our own, but by His. Also remember that the kingdom of God consists of both the heavenly and earthly realms. There will be a new heaven and a new earth for only the believers. 1551 Paul now reveals a mystery or divine secret about the rapture. This mystery is exclusive to the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace, that not everyone will die, but all will be changed. 
1552, this change will occur as fast as a twinkling of an eye in a fraction of a second with two sounds of a trumpet. At the first trump, the sound that the trumpet makes, the dead in Christ shall rise first, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17. Then with the second trump, we shall be changed. Notice how Paul includes himself because Christ did not tell him when the rapture would take place. The Trump may be the voice of our Lord, as mentioned in the resurrection of the kingdom on earth saints at his second coming, John 5 verses 25 to 29, see Revelation 1 verse 10. 15 colon 53 dash 55 we will put on immortal bodies that will last forever. When we have our eternal bodies, that is when our death and our grave will be conquered. For the kingdom on earth saints, it will be at his return to earth, not the air, Isaiah 25 verse 8, Hosea 13 verse 14. 1556, 57 death is the result of sin, Romans 6 verse 23. The thing that makes sin stronger and more obvious is the law. Christ has removed our sins and the sting of death. Paul thanks God for his plan of redemption. Our Lord Jesus Christ won this victory over sin and death for us. 1558 Paul now applies the sure fact of the resurrection to the believer's conduct. We can be steadfast because we have eternal life. Christ overcame both sin and death. On the cross he overcame sin, at his resurrection he overcame death. In light of this truth, we should be steadfast, stable, unmoved by bad doctrine, abounding in good works for the Lord, because we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. The things that we have done with Christ working through us will be of value at the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. As ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 20, we can do God's will, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Because the tomb was empty, Paul's preaching was not in vain, 14, and their faith in ours is not in vain, 14, and our labor is not in vain, 58. This life is a place of service and preparation for our eternal life to come. Our rewards in heaven are determined by what we do in this life here on earth. 15 colon 1 Moreover, brethren, I, Paul, declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, Paul had declared the gospel to them, and they had received it. They were already justified and standing by faith in Christ. Christ has done all that is necessary for our salvation. It is a free gift that can only be received by faith. We stand, positional salvation, justification, when we have his righteousness imputed to us, Romans 4 verse 25, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. The gospel is not something we do. It is something Christ has already done. 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. If they were saved, what does Paul mean? As we know, every time the word saved is used in the Bible, it does not mean from hell. This refers to being saved from deception and false doctrine if they continue in the truth of the gospel that Paul taught them nine practical. Sanctification. Look ahead to verses 12 to 14. Some were saying that they would not be resurrected, that the dead would not rise. Paul says they will be saved from this evil communication. See verse 33. Paul will show that both Christ's death for our sins and his resurrection are essential components of the gospel of our salvation. Without the resurrection, we believe in vain and without profit, because Christ's resurrection is tied to our own. 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Paul repeats what he told them in Corinth when they were saved. He had shared what Christ had revealed to him. Christ died by crucifixion for not only Israel's sins, as prophesied, but for all mankind's sins, not prophesied. Dot. 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, buried confirms his death and the placing of his body in the tomb. He rose again because the Father accepted his perfect blood sacrifice as full payment for all sins that have, are, and will be committed. 
according to the scriptures, means just as prophesied in the word of God. Christianity rests on facts. His death, burial, and resurrection are facts, and they were confirmed by many eyewitnesses. The grave could not hold him. The empty tomb is proof that he rose. See what Luke, Paul's companion beginning in Acts 16, wrote in Luke 24 verses 45 to 48. 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, Christ appeared to Peter who denied him three times, and then to the twelve, Matthias being one of them, James was not dead yet. Twelve is a collective term. Paul is separate from the twelve, he is the one apostle to the one body of Christ. 6. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Paul is the only one who reveals that Christ was seen by more than 500 at one time. Most of those eyewitnesses of his resurrection were still alive. 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Christ was seen by James, then by all the apostles, including Thomas. 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Paul saw Christ apart from the twelve, in Acts 9. Paul is a separate apostle, for a separate ministry. He was born out of due time, Galatians 1 verses 1 and 11, 12. All believers have Christ in them, John 17 verse 26, Colossians 1 verse 27. 9 For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meant to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul says that he is the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because he persecuted that church, the believing remnant of Israel or little flock, Acts 8 verses 1 to 3, Galatians 1 verse 13, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. This remnant will receive the kingdom and sit on the twelve thrones, Luke 12 verse 32, Matthew 19 28, 21 43. 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, the twelve, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Because of God's grace Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. He says, Christ did not give me this grace for nothing, because I worked more fervently than all of them, but it was not me but the grace of God that was with me. Paul is always careful to acknowledge the power of Christ in him. 11 Therefore whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Most of the believers at Corinth were saved by the gospel, good news, that Paul preached, but some were also saved by Apollos, and others by Peter and his group. Both Peter and Paul preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But Peter did it as a murder indictment, bad news, Acts 2.23, 4.10, 5.30, 1.12. Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah to sit on David's throne in the kingdom, Acts 2 verses 29 to 38. 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul asks, if the twelve and the five hundred eyewitness and I all say that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you denying what we preach? As we know, Paul and the twelve were willing to die for the truth of the resurrection. 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. Paul will now demonstrate the importance of the resurrection by a series of ifs. Everyone's resurrection is dependent on the fact that Christ was the first to be resurrected in a glorified body. Paul revealed that Christ's sacrifice paid for all sins. Christ's resurrection and ours are linked together. 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is useless, and your faith is worthless. 15. Yeah, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Paul says, we are found false witnesses because we said that God raised Christ from the dead. If he did not, then there is no resurrection of the dead. 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. 
Paul argues, if there is no resurrection of dead believers, then that means Christ did not rise. 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. They would be still in their sins if the Father had not accepted Christ's payment. If Christ did not rise, their faith has no eternal value. 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Then those who have died believing in Christ, whose bodies are now asleep, will not live again. 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If we only have hope of this life, then we are all doing this for nothing, wasting our time, and should be miserable. 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. But the truth is that Christ rose. From the dead, remember Paul saw him several times. Jesus is the first of those who died in faith to have a glorified body. 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. The reason Christ had to die was because death came by Adam. Christ became a man and was resurrected to undo what Adam had done so that others could have eternal life. 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We have to be in Christ to be saved. This is the proof text of the resurrection. 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ set his coming. The order of the resurrection was that Christ is the first fruits from the dead, Colossians 1 verses 18 and 19. Jesus was first fruits of those that will have a glorified body. They that are Christ's at his coming, the kingdom saints at his second coming. 24 Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. 25 For he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. 26 The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. After his millennial reign and the final rebellion, Christ will have secured all the believers to live in heaven and on earth. Then those who compose both realms, his kingdom, will be delivered to the Father. Christ will put down all opposition. All the enemies, including death, will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20 verses 9 to 15. 27 For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. In Psalms 110 verse 1, the Father speaks to the Son, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Father is excluded from what is placed under his Son's feet. 28 And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. When all is done, the Son will be subject to the Father who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 29 Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? What good is it for all who have been baptized, identified with, into Christ's death, Romans 6 verses 3 to 9, if they will not rise? 30 And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Why are we risking our lives if we will not be resurrected? 31 I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Paul says, I affirm so that you can have this joy yourselves. I remind myself every day that I am dead to the flesh daily. I am dead to sin and self, Romans 6 verse 2, and alive unto God. To overcome our evil flesh, we need to know, reckon, and yield to the fact that God says we are dead to sin, crucified with Christ, but alive unto God through Him, Galatians 2 verse 20. We are spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. We know, mind slash spirit, reckon, believe in our heart, soul, yield, our bodies a sacrifice, and take right actions. It is a relief that our lives are not about us, but about Him. This old earth and heaven and everything in it will all burn up. God will make a new heaven and earth. Our value is life with Him in the new heaven and new earth. 
32, if after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth at me, if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If I had to fight with those beast-like men at Ephesus, Titus 1 verse 12, what profit is my struggle if the dead do not rise? The mob uproar in Acts 19 verse 40 had not happened yet, but Paul was already dealing with those adversaries. Let's just eat, drink, and be merry if there is nothing more to life than the present. But this life is not all there is. 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The corrupt communication that the resurrection would not happen was having an effect on their conduct. 34. Awake to righteousness, and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Paul says awake from this deceptive false teaching. Is there not a wise man among you? Speak no evil saying there is no resurrection. This evil communication and thinking is sin. Paul wants to throw cold water on them so they will wake up and think and act like the righteous saints they are. They need to follow what Christ teaches them through Paul. He blames the Corinthians for the lack of understanding of what God is doing and his word. 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Some were asking about the specifics of resurrection, so Paul begins to answer that. 36. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. They should know that something can't come alive if it hasn't first died. 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat, or of some other grain, we are going to get different bodies than what we have now. Christ also spoke on the subject, John 12 verse 24. God may use the bare grain such as an atom of the one we have now. 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. God will do what pleases him, and each seed has its own body. The glorified body retains the identity and individuality of the believer. 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. 40. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Just like there are different kinds of flesh, men, beasts, fish, birds, so there are different types of glorified bodies. The heaven-bound saints and the earth-bound saints will both have glorified bodies, but they will each be different. One kind is celestial, suited for heaven, and another is terrestrial, suited for the earth. Dot. 41. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Celestial bodies differ in glory. Each star shines with a different intensity. Daniel 12 verse 3. In astronomy, the lower the number is, the greater its magnitude. So, a zero is the brightest, and a five is the dimmest star we can see with the naked eye. 42 So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption, this is how the resurrection of the dead is also. Each person will shine with different wattage. Christ in us will be our light. Our corrupt bodies are raised without corruption. 43. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Our bodies are sown in dishonor and weakness, but raised with power. It is sown in natural body, but raised a spiritual body. 45. And so it is written, The first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Adam became a living soul, Genesis 2 verse 7. But Christ became a quickening spirit who gives life and light to those who trust in what he has done. The last Adam reversed the curse the first Adam brought into the world. We will have his light in us as we shine in the heavens. 
46 Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Just like the spiritual, Christ, was not first, but the natural, Adam, was first so it is for us, we are natural, then spiritual. 47 The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Adam was of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. 48 As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. 49 And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We were earthy and made in Adam's likeness. But God will change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Philippians 3 verse 21 50 Now thus I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. We cannot inherit the kingdom of God in our flesh and blood bodies. Remember that we have been made joint heirs with Christ and will be glorified with him. Romans 8 verse 17. It is not because of any merit of our own, but by his. Also remember that the kingdom of God consists of both the heavenly and earthly realms. There will be a new heaven and a new earth for only the believers. 51 Behold, I shew you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Paul now reveals a mystery or divine secret about the rapture. This mystery is exclusive to the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace, that not everyone will die, but all will be changed. 52 In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This change will occur as fast as a twinkling of an eye, in a fraction of a second, with two sounds of a trumpet. At the first trump, the sound that the trumpet makes, the dead in Christ shall rise first, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17. Then with the second trump, we shall be changed. Notice how Paul includes himself, because Christ did not tell him when the rapture would take place. The trump may be the voice of our Lord, as mentioned in the resurrection of the kingdom on earth saints at his second coming, John 5 verses 25 to 29, see Revelation 1 verse 10. 53 For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We will put on immortal bodies that will last forever. 54 So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 55 O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? When we have our eternal bodies, that is when our death and our grave will be conquered. For the kingdom on earth saints, it will be at his return to earth, not the air, Isaiah 25 verse 8, Hosea 13 verse 14. 56 The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Death is the result of sin, Romans 6 verse 23. The thing that makes sin stronger and more obvious is the law. 57 But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has removed our sins and the sting of death. Paul thanks God for his plan of redemption. Our Lord Jesus Christ won this victory over sin and death for us. 58 Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul now applies the sure fact of the resurrection to the believer's conduct. We can be steadfast because we have eternal life. Christ overcame both sin and death. On the cross he overcame sin at his resurrection, he overcame death. In light of this truth, we should be steadfast, stable, unmoved by bad doctrine, abounding in good work for the Lord, because we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. The things that we have done with Christ working through us will be of value at the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. As ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 20, we can do God's will, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Because the tomb was empty, Paul's preaching was.
not in vain, 14, and their faith in ours is not in vain, 14, and our labor is not in vain, 58. This life is a place of service and preparation for our eternal life to come. Our rewards in heaven are determined by what we do in this life here on earth. Chapter 16 Concerning the Collection for the Saints and Farewell 16,1-24 Instruction for the Collection for the Poor Saints in Jerusalem and Salutations Chapters 1-6 to Paul reproves the Corinthians about things he heard from Chloe's house and reorients them to their identity in Christ. Chapters 7 to 16, Paul answers the questions they wrote to him in a letter brought by three men from their church. Remember, we are to divide mystery from prophecy, so I have a question. What does Jesus Christ mean when he says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free? John 8, verse 31. Is this verse for us? Answer, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8 verse 24. Israel had to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was their Messiah. Israel is sanctified by knowing the truth that belongs to them. But we need to trust that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. We need to believe our truth in order to be saved, the good news that belongs to the body of Christ. We do this by rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. All of the Bible is truth, but not all of the Bible is our truth. Some of the Bible is for the body of Christ, but most of the Bible is for and about Israel. We need to divide the Bible where God divides it. We have learned that sanctification is both our standing and our state, our condition and our conduct, walk. The letter to the Corinthians is not about their position, but about their walk. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 1 to 8. Paul began the letter to the Corinthians by rebuking them for being carnal and babes in Christ because of all the division and disorder in the church. He now ends the letter by giving them five exhortations. 1. Watch ye, be careful how you conduct yourselves, look for the Lord's return. 2. Stand fast in the faith, don't be moved away from Pauline truth. 3. Quit you like men, behave like mature adult sons. 4. Be strong, have moral fortitude to do what is right. 5. Let all things be done with charity, esteem others, love them, be giving. Like bookends, Paul mentions Stephanas in the first chapter, 116, and in the last, 1615, 17. Stephanas and his household were the first to be saved in Corinth. Paul was so pleased that they had addicted themselves to the ministry. May we all addict ourselves to getting out the word of God rightly divided in order to edify the members of the body of Christ. As you recall, Sosthenes was the one who wrote the words that Paul dictated to him. Paul wrote the stern letter, 1 Corinthians, out of love for them. It was tough love to correct their behavior. The Holy Spirit used the letter to convict them. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 4 Paul was full of joy and delight when he found out that his letter, 1 Corinthians, did in fact have the desired effect on the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7 verses 7 to 16. It did correct and unify the church at Corinth to get behind Paul. They did obey him and removed the fornicator who had changed his mind about his behavior and wandered back into the church. There was hope that they would correct many of their faults and continue in the sound doctrine that Christ was giving to Paul. They loved Paul and were sorry for how they had acted. Before we get into this chapter, let us review all of the chapters briefly. The dark stormy clouds of the horrific tribulation were brewing on the horizon in Acts 7, but God interrupted prophecy and inserted the mystery. God had a plan before he made the earth to form the body of Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 4, to fill the heavenly places. God now offers us grace and peace. We can relax and enjoy the blue skies and the glorious sunshine.
Today, God is offering salvation to anyone who will simply believe in his heart who Jesus is, the Son of God, and what he has done, died on the cross for our sins and rose again for our justification. Then once we are saved, we can work for God. The Bible tells us that God even used murderers like Moses, David, and Paul. So, he can use us if we present our bodies a living sacrifice for Christ to live. Through. The only thing that we can take with us when we die is the doctrine we have built up in our inner man, soul, and spirit. We read his word, then understand it with our mind, spirit, then we believe that with our heart, soul. This is how the word gets into our inner man so it can work effectually in us who believe, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. It is important that you understand the difference between the prophetic program and the mystery program because otherwise we will not be able to function the way God wants us to. Romans to Philemon is for the body of Christ. 16 colon 1, 2 Paul went to Galatia again in Acts 18 verse 23 and told them that they should take up a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. The church members generally met on Sundays, the day the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Collect on that day. 16 colon 3 dash 9 the Corinthians were to pick someone trustworthy to take the offering to Jerusalem. If it was fitting for Paul to go also, they could go together. Paul plans to come to Corinth when he goes through Macedonia, Romans 15 verse 19. Paul probably wintered with them in Acts 20 verse 3. He planned to stay till spring. Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus. The great open door for ministry was probably his teaching at the school of Tyrannus, Acts 19 verse 9. The enemies were the silver and copper smiths who made the shrines to the goddess Diana, Acts 19 verse 24. 16 colon 10 14 do not give Timothy a hard time. He works for the Lord like me. Be kind to him and help him on his way, so he can come back to me with the others. The Corinthians wanted Paul to send the eloquent Apollos, but he said he was too busy, but will come when he has a chance. He was probably busy ministering the word. We are to do everything with charity, unconditional love for others. 1615 in Romans 16 verse 5, Paul said that Epinetus was the first fruit of Achaia, so he was probably a member of the household of Stephanus. The first family to be saved in Greece are addicted to the ministry of the saints and the body of Christ. They are so enthusiastic about what God is doing and serving him by serving the believers. 16 16-18 treat these leaders and similar leaders and everyone who works with us with respect and yield to their wise authority. Paul was glad that these three men came and treated him with respect by giving him a list of questions the church was asking him. They wanted his instruction, advice, and words of wisdom for the believers at Corinth. They were courteous and showed Paul the regard that many of the Corinthians did not, to their shame, 414. Treat people like these with respect and credit, because of their good conduct, you have been blessed. 16-19-24 Salutations from Paul's several churches in Asia Minor, in Ephesus, in Galatia, in Coloss, in Laodicea, and so on. Aquila and Priscilla, whom they knew, had a church in their home again and send their greetings. Paul wants them to be affectionate to one another. Paul signs the letter himself. He began doing so after the forged letter to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 colon 2, 3 17, 18. Paul uses some Aramaic words. He says, Do not associate with a brother who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, 5 colon 11 dash 13. Let him be accursed our Lord come. Believers are to follow the one Christ sent, 4 16, 17. Paul begins and ends the letter with grace. He wants the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with them. Paul wrote this letter out of love for them, the local church, and for the church, the body of Christ, who he was helping Christ to build, 310, 916, 17. 16 colon 1 now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
Paul went to Galatia again in Acts 18 verse 23 and told them that they should take up a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Two upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. The church members generally met on Sundays, the day the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Collect on that day. Three, and when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. The Corinthians were to pick someone trustworthy to take the offering to Jerusalem. For, and if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. If it was fitting for Paul to go also, they could go together. Five, now I will come unto you, when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. Paul plans to come to Corinth when he goes through Macedonia, Romans 15 verse 19, dot. 6. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. Paul probably wintered with them in Acts 20 verse 3. 7. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. 8. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. He planned to stay till spring. Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus. 9. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. The great open door for ministry was probably his teaching at the school of Tyrannus, Acts 19 verse 9. The enemies were the silver and copper smiths who made the shrines to the goddess Diana, Acts 19 verse 24. 10. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Do not give Timothy a hard time. He works for the Lord like me. 11. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. Be kind to him and help him on his way, so he can come back to me with the others. 12. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. The Corinthians wanted Paul to send the eloquent Apollos, but he said he was too busy, but will come when he has a chance. He was probably busy ministering the word. 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. Stand fast in the faith and doctrine that Paul has given them. Keep looking for the Lord to return for us. Stay strong in the faith. Behave like adults. Be strong, not babies. 14. Let all your things be done with charity. We are to do everything with charity, unconditional love for others. Dot. 15. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. In Romans 16 verse 5, Paul said that Epinetus was the first fruit of Achaia, so he was probably a member of the household of Stephanas. The first family to be saved in Greece are addicted to the ministry of the saints and the body of Christ. They are so enthusiastic about what God is doing and serving him by serving the believers. 16. That ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us, and laboreth. Treat these leaders, and similar leaders, and everyone who works with us with respect and yield to their wise authority. 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. Paul was glad that these three men came and treated him with respect by giving him a list of questions the church was asking him. They wanted his instruction, advice, and words of wisdom for the believers at Corinth. They were courteous and showed Paul the regard that many of the Corinthians did not, to their shame, for 14. 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. Treat people like these with respect. Because of their good conduct you have been blessed. 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. Salutations from Paul's several churches in Asia Minor, in Ephesus, in Galatia, in Colossus, and Laodicea, and so on. Aquila and Priscilla, 
whom they knew had a church in their home again and send their greetings. Twenty all the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Paul wants them to be affectionate to one another. 21 The salutation of me Paul with mine own hand. Paul signs the letter himself. He began doing so after the forged letter to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 17 and 18. Dot. 22 If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Paul uses some Aramaic words. He says, Do not associate with a brother who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. 5 colon 11 13. Let him be accursed, our Lord come. Believers are. To follow the one Christ sent. 4 16 17. Dot. 23 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He begins and ends the letter with grace, for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with them. 24 My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul wrote this letter out of love for them, the local church, and for the church, the body of Christ, who he was helping Christ to build. 310 917. 17 Bible Study Principles. 1. Seek God daily and delight to know Him and His ways. You will soon fall in love with the author of His holy word, that I may know Him. Philippians 3 verse 10. 2. Read the Bible with the purpose of understanding what God is saying, even. If we have to read the same thing again, give attendance to reading 1 Timothy 4 verse 13. 3. Pray to God that He will reveal what the passage means knowing that God dictated His word. He dictated His word. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Psalms 45 verse 1. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, 2 Peter 1 verse 21. 4. Begin with milk and then continue on to meat, as newborn babes desire. The sincere milk of the word, that you may be able to grow thereby, 1 Peter 2 verse 2. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat, Hebrews 5 verse 12. 5. Be both biblical and dispensational, knowing not only what God is saying, but to whom, when, and in what context he is speaking, for God has given different instructions at different times to different people, Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9. 6. Study it as if we are mining hidden treasure. Yeah, if thou creest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Proverbs 2 verses 3 to 5. 7. Build on previous knowledge. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little, Isaiah 28 verses 9 and 10. 8. Compare scripture with scripture with wisdom from the Holy Ghost. Knowing that the living God in us teaches us from his living word, Hebrews 4 verse 12, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13. 9. The Bible uses parallelism. In the following verse A equals C and B equals D. So, the adder is the dragon, Satan. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Psalms 91 verse 13. 10. Dot rightly. Divide the truth in God's word, distinguish Paul's writings to the body of Christ, the mystery, from the rest of the Bible, prophecy. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Study the Bible daily, 
Although teachers can help, what we gain in our own study is much more profitable. 11. Keep in mind both the near and far context of the verse in order to understand how it fits in the passage, the chapter, the letter, and with the rest of the Bible. Think deeply and carefully about what you read, going over it several times in your mind. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. 1 Timothy 4 verse 15 12. Remember that the Bible has its own built-in dictionary. God will usually explain the meaning of the word in the paragraph in which it is first used or in the paragraph before or after the word is first introduced. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 13.do not isolate a passage and build a whole doctrine on it. Understand N Unclear Passage in the light of what you clearly do understand. For example, it is clear that baptism and the dispensation of grace is spiritual, Ephesians 4 verse 5, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, even though Paul Water baptized some during the Acts period. Remember that the book of Acts is a history of the transition from Christ's ministry through Peter to Christ's ministry through Paul. Acts is a bridge. We are not to park on a bridge or to get our doctrine there, but to keep moving to the other side. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 14. The purpose of Bible study is to have the mind of Christ, to think like Him. By reading His Word Often, the Holy Spirit will use the same word or phrase in multiple places in the Bible to help us find His treasure. For whom hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, 15. The phrase it is written 80 times in the Bible indicates that a previous verse is being referred to. Sometimes in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit will change the words of the Old Testament to augment the reader's understanding. For example, Leviticus 20 verse 7 says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. 1 Peter 1 verse 16 says it this way, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 16. 16. Dot remember, the rule of subsequent mention, progressive revelation which connects. New revelation with previous revelation to add more details. 4. Example, we do not learn the names of Pharaoh's magicians until 2 Timothy. 3 8, 17. Study. All of the Bible from the vantage point of Paul's epistles. Consider what I, Paul, say in the Lord give the understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Paul's. Letters produce godliness in us. Godliness is allowing Jesus to live his life through us. This is profitable now and in the life which is to come. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. This is the end of the series of part 5.